turn up the volume and free your mind because this is the Humans 2.0 podcast hosted by Mark Metry. What you feed your mind every day will shape your future. Listening to this podcast will strengthen your mind, thoughts, and beliefs. Leave behind the everyday mundane trivialities of your average human version 1.0 and meta-learn your way into becoming a human version 2.0 with a new upgraded guest in each episode. Enjoy. Puya Abofathi is the CEO and co-founder of Vizospace. With over 20 years of experience in designing technology for the medical, research, and consumer industry, Puya has a passion for tackling problems that can be solved by rethinking and combining today's available, tried, and tested technologies. Puya's specialties are human-machine interfaces, biomedical engineer at a hand research unit of Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney. His background includes working all over the globe on the world's only flying hospital, designing research tools for investigating how humans chew, and working on the novel rehabilitation glove, the exoskeleton. As a kid, his biggest dream was to one day become an inventor. Puya won the 2004 Australia Museum Eureka Prize for Inspiring Science. If you like this, please upload it on iTunes because it helps the show grow even more. Thanks. Puya, how do you spend your time here on planet Earth? Right now, uh, I'm very busy running running a uh, startup with my co-founders. Um, so. That takes the majority of my time, uh, or at least you know, a good half of it, and then the rest is being a devoted father and husband as much as I can. Um, I love it. The rest is thinking and listening to podcasts, whatever's left, the leftover bits. <laughs> love it. So, Puya, so how did you uh, find your way down this path? Um, I would love for you to talk to my audience a little bit about... Um, you know, your past with the ExoFlex and, um, you know, what, what, what led up to that? Um, I think I never grew up is the, the short answer. So as a, as a kid, uh, I, I was naturally drawn to, like, inventions and adventures and, like, a lot, lot, of, lot of kids do. And I just never got past that point of saying, well, let's focus on reality, let's focus on you know, making making a living and being having a serious job kind of thing. So uh, that's been good for a lot of things. It hasn't helped me financially, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's been the thing that has driven me always in in my decisions about what to do with my life as much as I can. You know, thinking about having a family as well. Um, so. If I'm given a fork in the road and one involves a corporate job um, that has a lot of money and the other one is solving a problem for someone else or for myself or or I'm um, exploring science or you know making a new gadget that could help others that's that's what I'm drawn to always love it, man um so uh so so tell us the story of the the exoflex because I think that's uh it's, it's absolutely fascinating. Yeah, uh, it, it was um, something that um, kind of fell in my lap. I was, uh, this is before I did my PhD. I was, um, after, I studied biomedical engineering at, at university, which is basically engineering um, in the field of medicine. So think about biomechanical equipment, uh, medical instrumentation, that kind of thing, right? So that's, that's the angle and flavor of the engineering that I chose to do. And for about three years, I worked on a flying eye hospital, traveling all around the world um, to various um, countries, mostly, um, you know, what we would call developing countries. I'm not sure I like that term, but um, let's say uh, maybe poorer countries in the world where they need um, they need help with eye care and eye surgery. So our, in our um, organization called Orbis, we flew around and we brought people onto a, a DC-10 aircraft and we performed um, surgery on them. And my job as a graduate engineer was to take care of the equipment on the plane. Anyway, um, I did that for three years and traveled to like 30 
something countries it really blew my mind and that kind of set the stage for me in terms of like thinking global always in everything i do and when i came back to australia um i was i was kind of lost i didn't know what else i would do with my myself and um while i was looking for things to do i came across this research lab at um at a hospital in sydney who were working with people with um paralysis so people with quadriplegia tetraplegia after spinal cord injury, who are able to move their arms. So they have the, the high level of injury that allows them to move their arms, but not their wrist or their fingers. So there's just one step away from independence. And so that, that got me thinking for the first time about you know the plight of people with disability and how we live in such a, uh, an unfair world where you know, things could be so much more accessible and the, you know, the playing field could be so much more level that we just don't do it so many simple things we could do like the ramp in every building is a you know the simplest solution for people with wheelchairs right and so many buildings don't have it um anyway with this particular um, research group their focus was bringing hand function back to people with with paralysis following spinal cord injury so we're talking about 18 year old you know boys men who've had a rugby injury or they're you know, diving. Mostly, mostly there were young men who would have these injuries and they would be confined to a wheelchair for the rest of their life. I mean, think about, think about that. That's, that just blows your mind thinking that um, how we take our health for granted. And um, one of the huge problems for people with those types of um, injuries is that um, they're dependent on carers to feed them, to groom them. And if they just had the ability to close and open their hands, they would be one level up in terms of independence. They wouldn't need someone for every little thing that they need to do. And so this, this uh, research group was looking into making implants or putting implants into, into the chest of, of um, such individuals, which would have wires going down their arms in, and innovating their muscles, hand muscles. And so through a, a shoulder movement that detects the, the signal saying, I want to close my hand, um, electrical signals are fired onto the muscles of the, the hands and the hand closes. And then another one opens it. Um, in, in principle, it's, it sounds quite simple, uh, but it's extremely you know, <laughs> invasive as a procedure. Um, and it's very sci-fi if you think about it. You know, you're basically doing the job of the brain, but delegating it to something else, to so a chip in your, you know, implanted into your body. Um, nevertheless, they managed to implant a trial on, on four individuals. Two of them worked really well. They actually got hand function back and they were really happy. Two of them didn't work out so well, but each, each um, operation cost $40,000 or more Australian, which is, you know, still a sizable money. So it's not the kind of thing that people can afford and, um, you know, I don't think governments are very good at putting money into disability. So um, the research group run by um, a guy called uh, Tim Scott were looking for the next gen solution that wouldn't be invasive. And they had heard about this research at another university in Australia that working on artificial muscles. So these are like um, polymers that when you excite them electrically, they shorten just like muscles do. It was all, you know, in labs and so on. It wasn't, it wasn't a practical solution. But when, when the the research group kind of found this out, they thought, oh, why don't we get polymers and weave them into gloves, and then you know people can wear the glove, and the glove is, you know, basically it becomes a, a artificial muscles for the hand and for the fingers, and it can close and open fingers without having to have an invasive procedure. So there, there began the project of trying to come up with this thing called, you know, the bionic hand or, you know, rehabilitation glove. There was different names for it. And this is around the time that I met them and I was looking for something to do. They offered me the, the job of um, actually engineering this a solution for, around this idea. And um, that was in 2003. So... After that, it was just uh, years of work. It turned into a PhD project. Um, I worked with this team to come up with um, initially some ideas around a glove solution. Um, later, it turned into an exoskeleton. Um, later, we've discovered that these 
you know, so-called intelligent material or polymers are way, way down the track. They're, they're just not available in any way that could be robust and, you know, that, that could like last last um, in a in a in a glove or have enough force and power to be able to open and close hands. So, what ended up happening is, and this is very typical of R and D projects, when you do stuff in a lab, things work out and you can publish results and people get excited about the the results, right? But the act of taking something from a lab into reality is such a humongous task that most interesting ideas and projects never see the light of day when it comes to actual reality and the lay person out there reads the news and obviously media likes to pick up on these things and they go artificial muscles are created or you know uh, artificial like you know hands and so on and everyone gets excited there's viral videos um everyone's expecting you know them to be available next the next day i was getting calls on a like a daily basis from people saying my husband's had a stroke and he can't move my, his hands. My son had an injury and he can't, he can't, he, you know, it was so hard to tell people, look, it's not, it's not available. It's just a research project right now. You know, I'll, I'll keep you on the list. I'll keep you on a mailing list. Um, so that went on for a while. We won a prize, um, a Eureka prize, which is Australia's, one of Australia's best science prizes. And um, eventually we got the interest of a company in the UK who said, we want to commercialize this. We want to turn this into a product. And, um, and so back in 2006, they came down. They said, we'll fund the industrial sort of design version of this project. Let's turn it into a product. And I was kind of in and out of the project by that time because I'd finished my PhD. So I left. Then I came back. Then I was a consultant to the project. So I've seen this thing go from the drawing board um, all the way to... Uh, manufacturing really um, as of a couple of years ago we we had all the design files ready to press the button and make this this device called the exoflex that had a you know commercial name by now um, and it, it is definitely a product it moves people's fingers it, it can be used for therapy for assessment for function it's incredible it's like space age by now so many people have worked on it I've managed the project for three or four years um, and um, it's still not in the market. And we don't know whether it will or will not be in the market one day because we still have to go through regulatory compliance, you know, a human construct that we've created around medical products, which is important, but is an obstacle nevertheless to getting something out there. That's a very long answer to your very small question. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, you did great. That was awesome. It's just super interesting. Like when I first heard about that, I was thinking the same thing, like, oh, artificial muscles, like all this stuff's going to get fixed. But, you know, these things definitely take time. Um, if uh, let's say somebody's trying to do that, whether they're tr trying to invent something and this might bridge into our next topic um, or, uh, you know, really do something that's uh, really R&D research development based. What would you uh, what would you tell them? Like. Is there anything that you wish you knew, you know, before you did all of this, you know, maybe in a not so specific way, so it can be, you know, applied broader than just um, the Exoflex? Yeah. I know exactly what to answer there. Um, start yeah. with the needs. Start with the uh, with the experience and the the needs of the per the people that you are making this thing for. Validate it. But validate it not only in terms of the needs, but also in terms of the solution that you think would you'd want to find this is like a typical startup process now um back then we were excited about an engineering you know solution as opposed to the, I, I, the, the human need was there you could see like people need to be able to move their fingers right that, that need is obvious who wouldn't want that if they're if they're paralyzed but what would they be willing to pay and what um what obstacles would they be willing to overcome would they be willing to have, like in the case of the implant, would they be willing to have a $40,000 surgery? Would they be willing to put up with the risk of infection? Would they be willing to, um, to have to like change batteries every hour? Would they be willing to, you know, get smelly sort of devices on their hands because it picks up dirt and, 
the, all these things that come after, like when, once you start with an idea, an idea is great, and you think, wow, this would help so many people. Then you got to really think through what would it look like as a as a product that out there that's sustainable that you can buy off the internet or off take you know off a shop. Is it going to have a service industry behind it that's going to fix it when it, when it goes wrong? So many things have to be worked out. And what you realize when you embark on, a, on an R&D project is that you're really dealing with the tip of the iceberg. Mm. So that's why a lot of academia kind of st stay in academia, right? You don't see mm. that much transition from academia to industry. And there's a reason for that. It's because it's damn hard to go from, from ideas into products and realities and services and things that, that help people. And it's exactly what we're going through now with this other project, you know, with the with Visa Space that we've talked about before. Um, it's really hard. And so, what I wish I knew back in the old days was all this: how hard it would be, so that I would start thinking about the end result at the beginning, so that it would guide some of the decisions, some of the design choices. Um, but still, no regrets. It, it was awesome. what it was. Wow, man. You mentioned uh, VisoSpace, so you're the you're the CEO of that company. Uh, what is that, and how did it get? Um, how was it birthed into this world? Yeah, um, yeah. Thanks for asking. Um, so, so um, as I mentioned before, initially my career began with you know biomedical engineering and wanting to create you know devices that helps people. Um, I would say VisoSpace is has. N like is is a much wider um, entity and project. It's not it's not medical. It's not um, it's not. It doesn't have a direct application. It it is a an entity that we created because just like yourself, and I've heard you say this many times. Um, we've seen the future, and we've seen the future involving immersive computing platforms. Um, and we believe that there's a lot to be done in improving the, the way we interact with with those worlds and with those mediums. And having seen the last few revolutions of computing, you know, starting from the personal computer to, you know, the, the coming of the internet and, and browsers to smartphones, like having seen those waves, um, one can relate to how forms of interaction that get locked in, they're really hard to change, right? Like you can't make a computer now without the common mouse and keyboard. They're, they are set in place, right? The, you probably know this, the, the, you know, the AS, ASD keyboard layout that we have now that you cannot change was designed, you know, 100 years ago when typewriters were there and it was specifically made in such a way that people don't type too fast because if you type too fast the the um the, the typewriter uh, levers will get stuck so they deliberately put um letters arranged it in a way so that um letters that commonly follow each other were further apart so that you wouldn't press them too fast did you know that i had no idea right so so we have a, a digital um keyboards uh, are linked to that mechanical world including mm -hmm. The keyboards on our phones now you know if you look at your iphone keyboard it's still got the same layout it, it's just great <laughs> and it's because it's it's been set in stone it can't be changed so it's not designed for today's age it's just designed for something you know a legacy of the past and so i'm kind of worried that um moving ahead and people adopting vr ar you know other forms of um, immersive computing that we get stuck in in sort of old paradigms and we really want to be there with with the innovators to have a say in how how we interact with these exciting mediums that are going to really add value to our lives you know i don't buy this thing that the fear of technology that a lot of people have that um you've, you've seen throughout the ages you know people have been scared of the radio the tv the computer the um, smartphones and now you know, AI, people are scared of VR, people are scared of AR, um, people are scared of the future in general, at the same time being excited by it. But there's all these cautionary tales of, oh, with VR, you know, people are going to get isolated and locked in. I, I don't buy that. I think VR is going to make us more connected, not less. I think AR is going to 
give us superpowers and enhance uh, the way that we interact with, with natural life. Um, we're just going through a transition now with smartphones where, you know, I think you mentioned yourself in an interview, you see people always on their phone, you know, looking down kind of thing in yeah. the train. Like I, I, I've got this kind of thought experience. I, I, I watch people all the time and everyone's always stuck on their phone looking down. I'm like, what's going to happen with their necks? You know, their postures are so bad. But I think, I think the, the smartphone that we have now is just going to be a blip in history. It's just like oh, a, yeah. this transitional technology that we've had to lead yeah, us yeah. to um, immersive computers so that we embody our digital worlds in a way that is natural to us, that feels real, um, that we can, we can gain more knowledge of, we can interact with each other better, we can understand and visualize data a lot better, and so we can understand ourselves better and um, hopefully make better decisions moving forward for, for, the, for the planet we live on. I really believe that, but I also believe that for that to happen, we need to have the right um, interface. We need to be present in the most natural and useful way. If we make that harder, if we put obstacles in front of that, if we put all these like bad user interfaces, then um, it's just going to delay that, that revolution and we won't fully fulfill the potential. So that's what Visa Space is here to do, it, to solve interaction problems for, for the future of computers. Wow, man. And um, that's, that's brilliant. And, you know, you, you touched upon, you know, the fear of technology and how it's always been there and it's not just VR. 100%. Um, you know, I was talking to... Uh, Jason Pfeiffer, he's the editor in chief at Entrepreneur Magazine, and he has a podcast called The Pessimist Archive. And basically, <laughs> each episode is he goes back in history and looks at a particular technology that everyone was afraid of. So I'm looking at the list here, and it's yeah. like recorded music, um, yeah. horseless carriage, umbrella, yeah. uh, bicycle, chess uh va vaccines i mean people are still afraid of vaccines right yeah. now coffee <laughs> coffee uh pinball electricity it's just um you know we often think that you know the future with all these technologies it's going to be so crazy but if anything i think people that are like living 15 years ahead of us are looking back now and are like man these people are crazy yeah. and uh you know the reason why i say that is there's so many different use cases there's so many you know different applications of virtual reality and of augmented reality that can you know really change the the world i had on the one i uploaded today episode 70 reed banger he's the ceo of um north pass immersive and they've created this uh, mental health platform that can help people with anxiety and pain, specifically in the medical field, in virtual reality. So, like yeah. all these, all these different things are being used. And like, sure, nobody knows exactly how everything's going to fit into place. But you know, like you said, augmented reality is going to give us superpowers, a hundred percent. And I think you know, the smartphone, it's a blip. Yeah, and I think it's um, it, I think the smartphone symbolizes mobility, and and not being tied down, and yeah. you know I think that's gonna pick up with um, 5G and AR, and yes. we're gonna be living in a sweet awesome world. So how was uh, how was Viso Space um, how was it started? So at the back end of the Exoflex project that that we talked about before. Um, while we were waiting around to see what happens with the device and how it's going to reach the market, because we, we had done all the technical stuff, but we were still yet to do all the regulatory stuff. Mm. And um, it had been years, you know, well, like I said, the project started in 2003. So you can imagine how many years I've been in and out of this project and waiting for it to come to life. Um, one of the frustrations I've always had with that project is that I was never... I was never really in the driving seat of the um, business decisions. Um, I was just always sort of driving and helping drive the technical decisions. And um, so 
whatever whatever happened with it and its fate, I, I couldn't say whether or not I had I could have made decisions differently or better because I wasn't there to make the decisions. Um, and I really wanted to have a go at, um, at being in the driving seat, you know, myself and my, and uh, my, my colleagues, my co-founders. We wanted to start from scratch, um, try and solve some big problems, but be in control of those um, those the solutions and and um, the fate of that entity, right? So the natural thing is to start a company um, and then go and tackle a problem that you think is worth solving. So um, we decided to step out of the Exoflex project, at least uh, on a full-time basis. Um, and myself, Rob Siegel, my co-founder who was working with me on the Exoflex, and one of my closest friends and, and co-founder, Carmine Mastrantone, who's, who's a user experience specialist, we um, got together and we started playing around with VR and with haptic feedback systems. These are to be able to feel and, uh, um, and touch, you know, virtual things. And um, initially, our idea was to solve the problem of um, interaction through a haptic hand, just naturally because we came from a hand project. So we thought we would come up with a, a glove or an exoskeleton that would be used to feel and touch virtual objects. But there is an example of starting with a solution first. You know? mm. So we, we had come up with a solution first without fully analyzing and, and studying the problem. And um, I'll be the first to admit that. And I'm not saying that it's not worth solving or it's not worth doing that, that kind of project. But it's always good to understand the industry and, and you know, what are the real problems. And then also, like, look at what are low-hanging fruit problems and what, what are high-hanging fruit problems. And so for about four months after we started the company, this is April last year, we were just absorbing. We were just sponges talking to anyone involved in VR, AR, just f starting from Australia. We've got a vi very vibrant sort of VR industry here, um, talking to people who would benefit from VR and AR in their everyday life and in their workplace, and then talking to people overseas. You know, um, as you know, I'm very busy and, and active on LinkedIn, just reaching out to people and having as many conversations as possible. And, um, I'd say after like four months, we were sort of, we could be considered experts in the field. Um, I think if you throw yourself, it's, it's that kind of industry where if you throw yourself at it, you, you, don't, you don't assume that you know things. You're open to ideas. You keep in touch with the latest developments. It doesn't take long to become, you know, an expert, um, if you like. And you'll end up knowing stuff that, you know, other experts don't necessarily know. It's, it's just that, that fragmented right now. Um, so then we can really have really deep and important conversations with people who are real players in the field. So after four months, um, we analyzed the, the problem statements again, and we thought, you know, locomotion moving around in virtual worlds is actually, if not the biggest problem, one of the biggest problems um, face, that, that's been around for, from day one. So I've mentioned this to you before, but maybe because it's a new podcast um, um, episode just for your audience. So if you're in a, in a virtual world, um, your brain is believing the experience. So you are present somewhere else. And so it's expecting all the whole system of the body to respond to that world. So if you move your head around, you know, your brain is expecting to see the world to move correctly in kind. And if you move from place to place, it's expecting that you will feel, you know, your balance system, your vestibular system in your inner ear needs to respond in kind. And, and otherwise, there is a disconnect and you're, you either stop believing the experience or your brain actually feels uncomfortable. So we get things like nausea and, and you know, so-called discomfort um, have been problems of virtual reality from, from day one. In the early days, it was because of latency with head movement and because of frame rate. So even, even in a standing experience, if you moved your head around, because the, the world would sort of lag behind your, your head movement, that would make people feel sick. Nowadays, with the Oculus, the Vive, you know, the, the advanced headsets, that stuff is so good that your brain just can't tell the difference. Um, so as long as you're in one place, you can move your head in six degrees of freedom. So you go forward, back, left, right, rotate your head. 
the, the visual world moves exactly as you expect it, so your brain believes it, no discomfort. But you can only move two meters before you pull the cable or you hit a wall or, you know, um, so you can't move far. And so here you are with this incredible medium with unlimited potentials, but you can only move two meters in it. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous, right? So how do you enable m movement, free movement that feels, you know, enabling and, and empowering and gives you agency in that world? Um, well, uh, let's say you can use a joystick. Can you use a joystick like a computer game to move your body in that space? No, the answer is no. Um, like 80% of people will get sick when you do that because if you're moving digitally, you know, physically moving your body, the visual system in your head says, I'm moving, your vestibular inner ear system says, you're not moving, there's a disconnect, you feel nausea, the same as what you feel in a ship or in a car. So it's called motion sickness. Um, that, that in a nutshell is the, the problem that people face. And if you've ever felt nausea before in any experience in your life, you know that it's one of the worst experiences and you just want to stop doing whatever it is that's making you feel that way. And in VR, some people just don't want to do VR anymore. <laughs> They're afraid of going back once they get sick. So developers that make experiences in VR avoid digital kind of movement. And what they do is they enable this thing called teleportation. So you want to go you know, from here 100 meters away, you point your controller at that space and you, you jump from here to there. Um, it works. It gets you from A to B. But it's such a, uh, I feel like shortchanged when that happens. Sucks, sucks. It breaks my immersion, right? And I'm sure it's the same for a lot of people. So if you want to visualize a space or you want to um, hang around with your friends or maybe you're playing a, a sort of a, a, an eSport game with them, maybe you just want to shoot each other with, with, <laughs> with paintballs in, a, in some kind of you know, shoot 'em up game. You, you can't do it, especially in multi-user experiences because you're just jumping from place to place. And um, it's a real disruptor of the experience. So that is the problem statement. So then the solution for us was, well, we want to make, we want to enable people to move around in, a, in an intuitive way that their brain accepts and believes without getting sick. How do we do that? We looked at what other people are doing. You had um, people from 3D, 3D Rudder in your show, in your other podcast, um, talking about, a controller that's under your feet that moves people. We've had people like um, you, people have made in, you know Infinity Infinity Deck and Virtuix Omni. They make treadmills, different forms of treadmills. Um, if you've watched the uh, Ready Player One movie, you would have seen a treadmill in the van. That kind of thing exists, and it, and they they all work in their own way, but each one has its own problem. So for the um, for the big contraptions like the treadmills, the problem is they're expensive, they're bulky, they don't fit into your living room, they're not for everyone. They, they might find their place in enterprise solutions or in arcades, great for that because they allow you to feel like you're walking around without actually moving further away from your, your location. Um, but but they, they can't fit in everyone's home. And what we wanna do is we wanna we want everyone to use VR and to use it un in unlimited ways. That's the problem we want to solve. We want, we want the, you know, the VR and AR headsets of the future to be ubiquitous. Um, as common as your, your touch screen phones, as common as your laptops. And so for us, the solution was studying the human brain and going, what is it that makes you sick? What is it that reduces uh, the motion sickness? What do we really need to do to move around? And so we came up with this platform called the Alto. It's like a disc under your feet. Um, it's flexible. You can go and stand on it. And when you do, it becomes a hoverboard in your virtual reality experience. And then when you sort of shift your weight on it, push it one way or another with your feet, like as you're standing, you start flying in that direction. And you can feel the ground underneath you because it's got haptic feedback. And um, nice. And it, and it lets you move freely in a really fun, engaging way, and it doesn't make you sick. Like, we've had hundreds of people use it, test it, and maybe less than 5% have reported anything akin to um, motion sickness, which is a huge, huge leap from current sort of experiences. Like, doing the same sort of movement with a joystick would make, you know, 70, 80% of people sick. So, 
there's a solution, but what about the simplicity? What about the cost? All that stuff. You know, those are those are the you know the things I was saying to you before need to be part of your process. If you want to get something out into the real world, you've got to solve all those problems. And so for us, um, it's a really simple solution because it's very low sort of uh, height. It's only like, you guys think in centimeters or inches? It's about, <laughs> you know, <laughs> eight, eight centimeters off the ground. Um, it's like a 60 centimeter disc, or two feet maybe, uh, two, three feet diameter. Um, and you can sh you can shove it under your couch when you're not using it. It's Bluetooth enabled. We build it for the future of standalone headsets and mobile VR because we want we want the even the low level VR experiences to be able to be enabled on it. Um, and importantly, it is uh, an object that has its own character and personality in your experience. Just like when you mark want to walk around your house you're you're free to use your feet but if you want to go down to the shops you might go and sit in your car right so your car is its own entity in your life and you engage with it um as a, as a separate, separate entity and once you sit in it it kind of becomes a part of your body and you are you you are one with your car and you're totally okay with the fact that you're not walking to the shops you know, it's not a thing that in your head goes, I don't believe this experience because I'm not, you know, walking anymore. And I think that's what's, that's what, that's what's been the, the problem for people trying to solve locomotion. They've always tried to go, we need to walk. We need to come up with contraptions that allow you to walk in VR. But you don't need to walk. You just need a vehicle that you can get on and get off of. Um, so that's what we've, that's how we solve. That's the angle that we've kind of taken. Um, when you put your headset on, your car is your outer hoverboard and you can see it just where you left it when you didn't have your headset on so it's present in your reality and you're in virtual reality That's and awesome. you can still walk around like you do now two meters you know by two meters walk around have that kind of room scale experience but if a dinosaur comes to chase you or you know you want to fly to the top of the hill and see a different space you get on your outer and you fly off, and then you get off it again, and you walk around again if you want to. That's 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 it, um, and it's it's a fairly cheap solution compared to other other stuff. That's brilliant, man. That's so awesome. So, where do you think the future of all this is going towards? I strongly, strongly believe that um, we are sort of in the experiment phase with virtual reality. Um, again, history repeating itself. I see the VR, AR industry as very embryonic. It's akin to the 80s um, with, with PCs, right? Back in the 80s, PCs were just personal computers were just finding their way into offices, university departments, and you know, uh, students' homes, if if they were lucky enough to to be able to afford it, so it had very um, specific sort of use cases. It wasn't for everyone. You know, your parents wouldn't. I don't know about your parents, but my parents wouldn't have have bought a PC back in the eighties. They didn't have a need for one. Um, but in the mid nineties, with the with the internet becoming what it is, kind of in its modern form today, um, everyone wanted it. Everyone wanted to have a computer because they wanted to get on the, the web, right? The same thing happened with um, smartphones. Back in the old days, like late 90s, um, there were no, no real smartphones. There were mobile phones. There were smart devices like Palm Pilots, and neither of those things were really internet-enabled, internet right? When those two things became one, thanks to Apple, um, and you had your phone and the internet in your pocket, everybody wanted one. And so now everyone has one, even when they don't have clean running water or electricity all around the world. And the same thing will happen for VR. Um, yes, we do have the internet technically available on VR systems, but there's no real true browser. If you think about you know, the way we interact with the internet, it's always through browsers, right? And we take that for granted. Those browsers had to be fought for and won. There was, there was a browser war in the, in the 90s that had to be won by someone. You know? Uh, Netscape was one of the first to win that that race, and then you know they they then they lost the next battle and so on. 
and all the the sort of standards that we take for granted they've been they've been fought for and agreed on you know and that's they become standards and now everyone knows how to use a browser it's almost like intuitive and we don't have that in vr there is no standard right now with web vr there's no way of trying to understand what does the web look like in in um, virtual and augmented reality systems does it look like a, a browser that's like a big screen in front of you which is still 2d but it's sort of 3d is is the is is it like the oasis you know as imagined in ready player one is is each is each url website a planet that you go and visit and it's got content that you can walk around is it both you know those things haven't i'm not here to answer that i've got some some of our ideas and imaginations of my own but um there's so many great thinkers out there and these people need to like keep talking flesh it out and then you'll have some startup out there who will come up with this really clean neat beautiful solution that will just wow everyone and then people will start adopting and copying it and then before you know it you can have this incredible you know internet experience um using vr and everyone's going to want one because it will allow them to understand the world better to to experience social networking through physically like virtually physically like virtually virtual presence um you know it's like facebook on steroids right chat on steroids um that's that's the future for me I, I, it's an I, I i can guarantee you that's where it's going um i just don't know how long it will take yeah, yeah. i love how you broke that, that, that down that's great so Puya, where can people go to check you out and what you're working on? If you're on LinkedIn, um, just look for my name, Puya Abulfati. Say hello. I, I, uh, I'm really good at getting back to people and talking, and I love um, having great conversations. Um, if you want to check out what we're doing at Viso Space, then it's just viso.space. Could be simpler. Get on and um, have a look at what we're doing. Give us feedback. Put your email down in our website. You can reach me on Twitter uh, at Mechavolution. I might put that, you might have to put that in your show notes, <laughs> or you can check out our Twitter um, on uh, for Visor Space, which is at Visor Space. We also have at Visor Space Facebook, um, and we're about to launch our Instagram, which we haven't yes, done yet. Yes. <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, and you guys have uh, a crowdfunding Indiegogo right now for the Alto War, correct? Absolutely, and and it's um, it's a it's a it's the first of two campaigns, and this campaign is is um, targeting developers. So if you're a developer and you want to be um, part of this kind of what we we consider a revolution in locomotion in VR, um, then what we want is to create a community around us of just a hundred. So we've limited it to just 100 people so that we can have meaningful collaboration with each one. If, if it's too many, then it would be hard to do. Um, and with this 100, sort of out to 100 community, we're hoping to build a few experiences that would then take us across to the next campaign, which is the consumer version of the, the Alta. So if anyone's listening and they want to check us out and if, if they can support us in any way, even if you're not a dev and you want to put in 10 bucks, it would be much appreciated. Um, just go to Indiegogo and in the search box, type in Alto space VR and you'll see our uh, campaign. Awesome. And all those links will be down below in the show notes. Puya, thank you so much for coming on the show. Final thank thing. Um, I want, I want a request from you to ask my audience a, a question that they can themselves can can ask themselves whoo if that makes sense a mm -hmm. um a, a self-inquisitive question because i think questions are uh, very very powerful in unlocking yourself that's really good yeah absolutely look the best i can do is ask ask people to ask what i ask myself on a daily basis and and that is what's what's so special about about what I'm doing. What's we, we can all get caught up in in mortgages, in you know, the human construct that we've created around us. All these things that we get caught up in. Um, people are scared that robots will come and you know take their jobs and you know that's a that's a really bad thing. I always ask, you know, what's special about humanity? 
what why are we special compared to other creatures in this planet and what am, why am i special what am i doing that's making you know allowing me to be on this planet and how did i earn my right to be here so don't take mm -hmm. i don't take the you know the fact that i'm here for granted um i feel like i need to earn my place and um uh, I'd, I'd hope that everyone would ask that question of themselves at some point, you know, because it guides you, it guides your decisions, it guides, you know, what you think is valuable in life. Just break down the, the human construct and start from the fundamental level, just work your way up. What's special about life to begin with and what, what am I doing here? Mm. That's such a powerful question. I do that too. Puya, thanks so much for coming on the Humans 2.0 podcast, man. You're without a doubt a human 2.0 you know you're, oh, you're, you're, <laughs> you're building you're building you're building the future and i can't wait to look back on this podcast in like 10 years it's gonna be real interesting <laughs> thank you everyone thank for you, listening anytime my friend thank you everyone for listening this has been your host mark metro i hope you have a wonderful day thank you for listening to the humans 2.0 podcast there are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there and you chose to listen to this please subscribe share and tell a friend about humans 2.0 so they can improve as well if you loved listening to that i would love your feedback whether you're watching this on itunes google play youtube and anything else keep learning on the humans 2.0 podcast.